I've always been fascinated with gyroscopes, and I think it's safe to say that I share this fascination with anyone who's actually played with them or watched demonstrations of their behavior. Like most students of physics, I can appreciate the right-hand rule and the law of conservation of angular momentum for their predictive powers, but neither of these tells me much about why this rapidly spinning wheel should behave so unexpectedly, so non-intuitively, and so mysteriously. In this video, I hope to shed some light on this mystery. So, to try to get a sense of how or why gyroscopes behave the way they do um, without actually using a gyroscope, we're going to instead use this uh, device that I call a, a trajectory deflector in this thought experiment. And uh, basically it consists of a structure that has uh, four hollow curved tubes on it and the way we do our thought experiment is we launch these uh, four metal balls from four different directions into the uh, trajectory deflector and once the balls enter the tubes they're deflected or, or diverted and uh, they pass through the tubes with uh, no friction um, we also assume that the trajectory deflector is uh, perfectly stiff and there's no deflection in it and the balls pass through and then exit and so what we're going to do now is um, um, examine the forces on the actual balls and then that will allow us to determine the reactive force on the deflector and shed some light on um, what happens in gyroscopes. So I'm going to do two uh, cases. The first case being the simple case will just give us a quick sense of how this thing works and how the, uh, the vector uh, analysis works and then I'll move on to the more uh, sophisticated case which actually will shed some light um, hopefully on gyroscopes. So here we are looking at the uh, front view of the deflector and you can see each ball just about to enter its uh, respective tube and these black uh, arrows represent the uh, velocity or velocity vector at the point of entry and now I'm showing the balls leaving their tubes with a new velocity uh, vector. So in this frame now I've taken the uh, input vector and uh, relocated it or uh, superimposed it at the uh, point of exit and uh, this will now allow us to, uh, to create the vector which represents the change in velocity for each ball and uh, this uh, vector also represents the direction in which the some of the forces um, acted upon each ball as it uh, progressed through the through each of its tubes and uh, so we can take that same basic vector now and uh, flip it around 180 degrees and um, locate them at the midpoint of each of the ball's trajectories and this will now um, indicate the reactive force um, imposed upon each tube uh, by virtue of Newton's uh, third law and now we can uh, strip away everything else and look at these uh, reactive vectors and we can see that uh, they all react uh, directly through the center of the uh, deflector assembly so we shouldn't expect any uh, any torques and we can also see by this circle that they're all the same uh, magnitude so we shouldn't uh, expect any um, some forces on the deflector we can spin the deflector around looking at the side view and we can see that the forces are in the plane of the deflector so there shouldn't be any uh, torques in any other plane as well as we can see from the top view. So the conclusion, uh, no non-intuitive reactive forces upon the deflector. Okay, now the uh, more interesting case. Now in this uh, thought experiment we're going to begin uh, exactly as we did in the previous experiment but this time just after the balls enter their, uh, their curved tubes we're going to impose a torque about the x-axis as shown and this will uh, simulate the effects um, imposed by gravity on a real gyroscope if it was um, actually supported right at this point here. So um, it just as the balls um, enter the tubes we impose a torque and allow the balls to progress and uh, continue to exert this torque um, and then just before the balls exit we stop rotating the, uh, the, the deflector. So let me, let me reverse that just so you can see that again. So the balls are just getting ready to exit now. We stop 
the rotation about the x-axis, allow the balls to exit. So now in this uh, frame we can see the uh, input vectors on, on each ball as well as the uh, output velocity uh, vectors. And now we uh, copy the uh, input vectors at the exit location and this allows us to derive the change in velocity uh, vector for, um, for each ball. And this vector also represents the direction in which the uh, some of the forces was exerted upon each ball as it moved through the uh, moved through its tube. And as in the previous thought experiment, we can take these uh, these vectors and uh, flip them around 180 degrees and relocate them as shown at the midpoint of each uh, tube. And this will now represent the um, reactive forces imposed on each tube. So here's a quick uh, three-dimensional spin of the entire uh, deflector assembly just so that you can see uh, how all these uh, vectors are actually uh, oriented. Okay, well now let's take a look at these uh, reactive uh, forces on the deflector and see if they might uh, reveal something about how a actual uh, gyroscope behaves. Um, so we can look at the uh, new uh, tilted front view, that is the looking down the y-axis um, after we've tilted the uh, deflector about the x-axis. And um, the first thing that becomes obvious from this diagram is we can see now that the forces do not act down the center of the y-axis. Um, and we can also see from these two circles that the uh, red uh, vectors are a little bit larger than the green vectors. Uh, these two circles uh, illustrate that they're, the angle of each uh, the green vectors and the red vectors are slightly different. So we can imagine that the uh, red vectors are going to uh, create a torque in the clockwise direction and the green vectors a torque in the counterclockwise direction. Now whether these two torques are perfectly uh, counteracting, um, I didn't go into that analysis here. Um, but um, what's more interesting, I think, is if we actually go to the top view now and uh, look down the z-axis, we can see that the uh, green uh, vectors are entirely out of the plane, uh, the midplane of the deflector, and these uh, two forces are going to create a torque in the counterclockwise direction about the z-axis, and it's this torque that would uh, create uh, or cause the uh, gyroscope to uh, precess about uh, this point, uh, much as we see uh, real gyroscopes precessing. And uh, similarly now if we go to the uh, side view here, uh, we can see that these same two uh, force vectors are going to induce a torque in the counterclockwise direction about the x-axis, and this would be the torque that uh, prevents the gyroscope from actually falling over uh, due to gravity. I hope this video helps clear up some of the mystery about why gyroscopes precess and why they appear to defy gravity. In essence, as the arc of each point mass on the rotating rim is deviated, it imposes a reactive force on the overall gyro, and the direction of this reactive force is a function of where the point mass is on the circumference at that given time. That is, as shown by the demo, the green deflector tubes have the greatest impact. And lastly, for the sake of clarity, I intentionally exaggerated the amount of induced tilting or rotation about the x-axis. And one might object by saying that real gyros don't move anywhere near that amount. And in fact, some don't seem to move at, at all in the downward direction. I would reply by saying that this is actually due to what's referred to as nutation, as shown in this video. And that every gyro, in order to precess, must be doing this to some extent, even if it's barely measurable. Well, thanks for watching. I look forward to your comments.